Welcome everybody in this week's seminar. We have a great pleasure to host virtually Diego Garcia Martin. Diego is a PhD student and of uh, in between like two different cities, Barcelona and Madrid, but also works a lot in Abu Dhabi in Technology Innovation Institute. Yeah, so so Diego special okay worked on many uh, things in quantum uh, information, but uh, he's mostly maybe interested in near-term algorithms. So he did some work on over-parameterization of uh, variational quantum circuits on uh, how, what it was like, uh, principal component analysis on these devices, some work like that, right. Also worked a bit on entanglement theory, how to, like he said, how to measure tangle, tangle, some measure of entanglement, like experimentally. Right. And today, but today he'll be talking about uh, something which is somehow in between, uh, let's say, uh, NISC, like, yeah, NISC physics and, uh, yeah, and maybe falter and computation, namely those algebraic beta uh, circuits. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay, sorry for being a bit chaotic. Uh, great to have you, Diego. The, the screen is yours. Okay, thank you very much, Michal. Uh, yeah, so today we'll talk about uh, our work entitled the algebraic beta circuits. And um, so this is the overview of the talk. Uh, by the way, uh, I guess if, if you have questions at any moment, just uh, please interrupt me. Um, uh, so so yeah, so here, here is the overview. So first I will start with the background section where I will explain what is the algebraic uh, beta ANSAT, which is used to solve uh, 1D models in condensed matter physics. Uh, then I'll introduce the XX set model. And then I will give some motivation uh, for why uh, it is interesting to transform this uh, be classical beta ANSAT into a quantum circuits that can be implemented uh, on a quantum computer. Uh, so then I will I will uh, explain uh, our proposed uh, method to transform this algebraic beta ansat into the algebraic beta circuits, and then I'll, I'll show how to apply it on the XXZ model. And then before concluding, I will I will show you um, a result that we uh, derive. Uh, uh, while uh, uh, working on this conversion, uh, which um, which is a new um, form of the Jambuster or the famous uh, Jambuster equation, um, and we actually have found a unitary form of this Jambuster equation. Uh, and then finally, I will just uh, uh, provide some uh, conclusions and, and discuss some open questions. Uh, okay, so okay, these are these slides. I have them because I gave this talk to some condensed matter physicists, so uh, I wanted to be, uh, to make this disclaimer. Uh, the better answer is is a field in itself, um, so it's a very complicated thing, and uh, and I'm no expert on it. <laughs> okay, having said that, uh, let's go uh, for it. Okay, so what's the better answer? So the better answer is uh, is a highly su successful uh, classical method uh, that provides uh, that solves uh, integrable quantum models in condensed matter physics in one dimension. So what this means is if we have a a model which is integrable, which means that it fulfills the Jambuster equation, which I will introduce later. It doesn't matter for the time being what this Jambuster equation is. Um, then we can apply the, the better answer to obtain all the eigenstates or most of the eigenstates uh, of, the, um, of the Hamiltonian. Uh, and the way to do this is instead of diagonalizing the Hamiltonian, which is in general, uh, it's a difficult uh, problem. Uh, what we need to do um, in the better answer is to solve a set of algebraic equations which for the XXZ model are the ones that I'm showing here on the screen. Um, so here the, we are looking for the lambdas. Uh, the lambdas are called the roots of the beta equation or the rapidities. And here gamma is, is just a parameter which depends on, on the Hamiltonian and it, I'll, I'll show you later. Uh, 
So uh, once we solve these equations, which uh, is typically done by numerical methods, uh, then uh, from these lambdas, we can uh, obtain the eigenstate. Uh, and there are two variants of the better answer. One is the coordinate better answer, and the other one is the algebraic better answer. And I will I will focus on the, on the second one in this in this talk. Um, uh, sorry, Diego. C can I uh, just maybe on high level, like what structure has to be? Like, will you be uh, explaining like what structure has to be present in the Hamiltonian so that you can solve it via better answer? Yeah. So the main uh, the main. I mean, it must, as I said, it must uh, fulfill the Jan Buster equation. Um, and the systems that fulfill these equations, uh, so I mean, there will be like a, a big set of conserved quantities. Uh, so that's why the, the, the problem is simplified and, and we can solve it. Um, and typically, I mean, this is for 1D systems, so systems in one dimension, and then you have like the XX set model, you have the Free fermion models, of course. Uh, you have uh, the Fermi mo Hubbard model, and uh, and there are others as well. And the Kondo model. Um, so there there are quite a few models that uh, are amenable to to this technique. Mm -hmm. and, and as I said, this, it's it, yeah. So and this equation. So it is. So you have a bunch of parameters lambda i, and you need to sort of uh, so sort of find them, right? So, so th those are the unknowns. Exactly. Okay, but like those equations don't look easy. Like, okay, like those are some some constraints. But like, is it kind of guaranteed that okay that the equation no. exists and is unique and so on? No, um, no, no, no. I mean, there is also a. It's also a field of research, but there are uh, uh, numerical methods. Uh, I mean, typically this, these equations are, are difficult, and you are not uh, you don't have the, this kind of guarantees. Uh, so what people typically do is um, is solve them numerically, and in many cases this is this is possible. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it it has been done, um, but uh, yeah, but in general they are not easy to solve. Uh sure uh, thanks and okay just okay. in terms of number of parameters like if i have n side hamiltonian how many parameters i have you have okay this will depend so the, this these equations will depend on the hamiltonian and here this is for the xx set uh, model so we have a u1 symmetry uh, which means that uh, the number of ones is preserved so here n is the number of sides and m is the number of ones so you will have uh, M M solutions. I mean M solutions. No, sorry. M M M M and unknowns, uh, not M solutions. Uh, so you have M unknowns, and then uh, you need to solve these equations for each uh, sector. And uh, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um. Yeah, so once uh, these equations, these beta equations are solved, then uh, the algebraic beta answer uh, provides the eigenstates. Um, well, originally it is done in, um, in an algebraic way. I will not present here because what, uh, but because it's been shown that uh, this is equivalent to a tensor network uh, formulation of the eigenstates. This was proven in a paper by Bestraete and Korepin and, and Murg. And, um, this tensor network is the one that will be useful for our purposes. Um, so this tensor network is cast in terms of a matrix R, which is the one that will satisfy, satisfy the Jan Buster equation, uh, which is the one that guarantees integrability. And this R will depend on, on one parameter, on one on root of the beta equation. So it will be R of lambda. Okay, so how this works. Uh, so let, let's say we have n sites uh, here, capital N. And as I said before, um, we have a U1 symmetry, which means that the number of ones is preserved. If we express our uh, eigenstate in the computational basis, then all the basis vectors 
uh, with non-zero amplitudes will will have a conserved number of ones. Um, so let's say we want to construct an state, an eigenstate with with uh, one with one magnum, a so-called. Uh, that means with where all the basis vector have only a single one. Um, then uh, what we do is we use these R matrices, which here are reshaping into four index tensors, uh, where each index can have two values, zero and one. And uh, here R1 uh, means R of lambda one. And then we apply all these R operators here, this first row. We input a one here. Um, we impose that the output here is zero. Uh, and since these matrices preserve, our matrices preserve the number of ones, this guarantees that the one will just go up to our state. Uh, so all this line of R ones, this will create the state of one micro. So it's like applying the uh, creation operator to uh, the reference uh, state, uh, all zeros. Then if we want to create a, se a second magnum, we, um, we just add another uh, row with, um, with our matrices with a different um, uh, rapidity, with a different root of the equations. And we do so if we want an M magnum state, we, we apply all these rows. And then as um, you can sorry, see- Sorry, you use the name uh, magnum, uh, right? So like- uh... Right, so so you mean like excitation or so is it yeah. like a fermionic Hamiltonian or uh, not, or like it has this let's say symmetry that you can let's say split your problem into like problems that have like fixed number of those magnets. Exactly. Okay. Exactly, that's it. You have a Hamiltonian with which preserves the U1 symmetry, so the number of excitations or magnums or ones uh, as you prefer is conserved so you can um yeah so the, the hamiltonian splits into these uh, different sectors um yeah uh, that's it so i mean and this this for instance the xx set model which is it, the one in which i will focus this can be mapped to uh to to interacting uh, models spinless fermions uh so you can think of it in terms of of that if you prefer yeah thanks um so okay so this is the construction for the um for the uh, to construct these uh, eigenstates so you can see that once you have the lambdas then you just need to fit them in in the tensor network and then you get uh, your state um but the problem is that these are matrices are not unitary so okay if we are using classical methods we don't care but of course if you want to uh to transform this to a quantum circuit, then this is a, a big problem. Uh, and this was the main battle that we had uh, because, okay, there is an, let's say, straightforward way of doing it, which is you can, each matrix, for each matrix, you uh, add an ancilla qubit and then you unitarize uh, your operator. Uh, but the problem is that then you have to post select on every uh, ancilla. So, so the expected probability of success is going to be uh, very, very uh, small. So we, we wanted to avoid uh, that. Um, OK, um, now um, the model in which I will focus is, is the XX set model. Uh, so it's, it's a well-known example in quantum magnetism. Um, and the Hamiltonian is given by by this formula here. So we have XX term between nearest neighbor in a chain, in a 1D chain, uh, YY terms, and then delta uh, uh, set set term, where delta is called the anisotropy. Uh, so when delta is equal to, uh, to zero, um, we have the XX model, which is a, a free fermion model. Uh, but when delta is different from zero, then, the, then this is an interacting model. And in particular, we will between uh, minus one and one, uh, which is the interesting. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, there was at least on my side some problem of connection. Like last, so you were explaining that if delta is zero, then it's free fermion model, and then if if delta is different from from zero, then then this is an interacting uh, uh, model. Um, 
And in particular, the, the, the interesting region is uh, the region where delta is between minus one and one. So this is the, the, the region we will focus on. But OK, this will not play a big role in what I will explain. Uh, why, later. why is it interesting? Uh, that's a good question. <laughs> I, I, um, and um, so it's a, it's OK, let me try not to say anything wrong uh, about these condensed matter uh, models. Uh, so there, in that region, it can be described by a conformal field theory. Um, and um, yeah, and, uh, and also it's critical, I think. Uh, so yeah, so I mean, and I think outside of it, of it, it uh, in the limit, it's, it's, it's easy to solve. Uh, but don't take me too seriously on that because again, I, I'm not a condensed matter physicist. Uh, there were people in the project that knew much more about it, but um, uh, but yeah, I think these are two hints of why it is interesting in, in that region. Thanks. Um, so here, um, so here we have uh, yeah this matrix R, which is uh, the key of the um, of the tensor network uh, and sub formulation. And as you can see, okay, here rho is just a is a, is a, is a parameter, and uh, you can see here that this matrix uh, preserve the number of excitations. And um, okay, and here you have the explicit dependent with the with the uh, rapidity with the better root, and then gamma is as I said, is a parameter which uh, is a function of this delta. Um, Right. So, okay. So now, some motivation for why we want to transform the algebraic beta answer into a quantum circuit. Um, sorry, you mind? sorry to ask yet again another question, but like you were, uh, I'm just a bit confused about this because uh, those matrices are those were in the like previous slide that they had the two inputs to. Okay. So should I should uh, I think yeah. of them like as like four by four matrices because of that or yeah, sorry. Uh, so here, I mean, you can reshape them as you wish, uh, but if you take these two, uh, so here, this is the R matrix, but here it is reshaped into a, a four index tensor. But if you look at the arrows coming in and coming out, you can think that it it is like uh, it acts on yeah four possible inputs, which are zero, okay. zero, zero, one, one, zero, one, one, and the output is also. Uh, so if you reshape this tensor into a four by four matrix, then you get the this this R matrix. Thanks. Um, yeah. So um, yeah. As I, as I said, like some motivation for why we want to transform the the beta ansat into into a quantum circuit because you might be thinking, okay, we can solve these models uh, classically, right? I mean, I just saw a construction that gives you the answer. Um, so why 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 it's interesting? Uh, well, first thing is that you might have the state, or you might have like rather like a mathematical representation of the state. Uh, but that doesn't mean you can, or that it is known how to compute um, any observable that you want on uh, on the state. So let's say I give you a, a, a wave function, like a, a sum over terms with some coefficients, and then I ask you what's, what's the value of this uh, long range and high order correlator uh, for this state. Uh, so this is this is a difficult problem uh, in general, and many people have been studying this for many years. And there are many, uh, in particular, long-range and high-order correlators that uh, that uh, are difficult to obtain uh, both analytically and numerically, classically. So this is a firm first motivation to construct this I get this this state on a quantum computer to have direct access to this uh, to these correlators that you can directly measure. Um, then another uh, reason why it might be interesting to, to construct these uh, eigenstates is because they can be used as input inputs uh, to other uh, quantum algorithms. So for instance, let's say we want to study Hamiltonian coins, which means we have our uh, XXZ uh, Hamiltonian, but we want to study what happens when the Hamiltonian changes for some physical reason. And uh, yeah, then you may need this eigenstate uh, and then change uh, the Hamiltonian and do quantum simulation, which uh, may not be classically uh, simulable. Uh, and finally, a third motivation to construct this, these states is to benchmark quantum hardware, because in some cases, uh, you actually know uh, 
some uh, two-point correlator function or some observable. So, so this can be thought of as, as um, application-oriented uh, benchmarking. And um, here I, I'm pointing to this reference uh, um, by the group by Sofia Economou uh, and collaborators in, in Virginia, where they um, propose a quantum algorithm to transform the beta ansat, but the coordinate beta ansat, not the algebraic beta ansat, into a um, although both give the same uh, result, of course, they give, give the same state, uh, to transform it onto a quantum circuit, into a quantum circuit. The problem with, with this algorithm is that um, it only works for a real uh, solution of the bet equations for real lambdas, uh, but the lambdas in general are complex. So there are many eigenstates that you cannot uh, prepare. Uh, that's the first thing. And then the second thing is that the, this algorithm is probabilistic. It uses some scillas, and then you have to post select on them. And it was shown in a in a in a posterior paper in another paper that uh, the probability of obtaining the desired eigenstate of, uh, for this algorithm uh, decreases factorially with the number of excitations. Um, so so yeah, I think with this, I, yeah. So can I ask so? So those those methods they they capture let's say yeah the, okay they allow you to to get a grip on eigenvectors but like uh, do they also like is it needed to to find the lowest energy state or, or not to find the ground state from those so this... um, well it is known uh, uh, how to yeah how to obtain the ground state. Um, uh, as, a math, as I said, as a mathematical uh, expression. Um, I mean, I guess it depends on the model, but uh, for the XX set model, uh, it can be done because the number of magnums of the ground state is known. Uh, it's actually, if you have n side is n halves. Uh, mm -hmm. So you need to solve the bet equations uh, for, um, for that sector. And then uh, given the, um, the solution to the bet equation, uh, you can also get the 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 energies uh, right from the solution, so you can actually uh, find also the ground state. Um, sure, sure. But in this half feeling sector, do you have exponentially many eigen? That's true. Um, okay, gotcha. And but there is um, there is some condition on the lambdas which I don't remember now, uh, which allows you to know uh, which one is the one that gives you the. Uh, the, okay. uh, the eigenstate. Uh, this exists for the XX model. Uh, for others, I'm not so sure. I think for Fermi Hubbard, it doesn't, uh, but um, I'm not sure. But for the XX, uh, yeah, you can solve and, and yeah, that, that's correct. You don't need to compare between uh, this exponentially many in this sector. You, there, there are conditions that tell you uh, which is the ground state. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. again, th these problems remain. You have the ground state in, a, in some mathematical form but still you you don't know how to compute this this long range and high order correlators um right yeah so now i i will i will introduce the method to transform this tensor network into a quantum circuit um yeah so as i said we will we will uh, uh, obtain a deterministic circuit and we will not use ancillas um, and the main technical tool that we will use is the QR decomposition. Um, so what's this? So given any matrix A, you can always decompose it as the product of two other matrices, Q and R, uh, where Q is unitary or, or an isometry if it's not a square, and R is upper triangular. Um, so here we have two possibilities. Um, so let's say we have a K times L uh, matrix. So there are two possibilities. Either uh, the number of rows is uh, smaller or equal than the number of columns. In this case, uh, then the Q is a unitary square matrix, K times K, and R is K, time, and K times L uh, matrix where all the um, elements below the main diagonal are zero. And the other possibility is that the number of rows is larger. Oh, sorry, this is a typo. This should, this should be K and L. Uh, sorry about that. Um, um, 
when the number of uh, rows is larger than the number of columns, then uh, Q is a non-square matrix. It's, a, it's an isometry uh, such that Q, Q dagger is, is the identity and R is, is a, an, a square upper triangular matrix. Uh, so as I will show, show, what we will do is compute QR decompositions iteratively. Um, so first we will define a block in our circuit to which we will, we will apply this QR decomposition. And then we will um, be transferring the non-unitary matrix R towards the end of the circuit. And then we will show that at the end, and this non-unitary part that remains after this process is just a global factor. Oh, sorry, so, so that we can discard it. And now I will go in detail into these steps so that it's more clear. <laughs> um, a global factor that has bounded magnitude or that is very, uh, let's say, large or small. Um, I don't know, uh, but uh, we shouldn't care because um, because we will just uh, retain the unitary part. Uh, so whether this factor is big or small, it, I mean, it shouldn't be too small because if it is, then if it were, then the um, the algebraic Betanza, the tensor network would not be, uh, I mean, if it is very small, well, I mean, uh, so should I, uh, so if, point uh, numbers, if I understand, so, so, so basically this algebraic Betanza, it gives you, eigenvector perhaps but it, it's not necessarily normalized eigenvector it is it is not normalized in general actually yes i mean it, it's not normal i mean for it for some models like some scattering models uh, mm -hmm. in high energy physics uh, then you have some unitary r matrices but for the xx model they are not uh, unitary um so right. all like like this is kind of why so you say sort of like removing this the scalar factor would just amounts to somehow normalizing perhaps the exactly okay thank exactly. you so we will just have like yeah the same thing but unitary uh with the quantum circuit um right so uh this is the sketch of what we will do i will explain it in detail don't worry uh, here, I just want to show you what's the first step. So uh, let's say we have the algebraic beta answer, uh, as I showed before. First thing we do, uh, it's we redraw it in a way that is more suggestive uh, for our purposes. But here we did, did, we did nothing um, but redrawing. So here, what we do is uh, this uh, ones here, we just uh, take them to the, to the bottom uh, so that we have M plus M uh, uh, let's say qubits or spins here. Um, so we have all these zeros and then all the ones here, as you can see, all the ones and all the zeros. And then uh, this goes, uh, this bar goes to the top. So we have uh, the eigenstate and the ancillas. Uh, so this is just a redrawing of the same thing. We did nothing here in this step. Um, so what, and then, then I will explain the method to convert this thing, which now resembles a quantum circuit, except that the R matrices are not unitary into a, a proper uh, unitary quantum circuit, which will have this ladder structure. Um, and what we should notice here is that there is an, a block or a, or, a, or a structure, a cell that repeats itself along the circuit, which is this R1 through Rm uh, block of uh, our matrices, right? You see, there is it's here, here, and it's all over the place. Okay, uh, so this is the first step. We define our uh, our units, uh, our basic cell, um, as this uh, contraction of R one through R m uh, matrices, and we call this the the calligraphic R tensor. And and so the circuit can be written as a series of uh, I mean, the better answer, not, this is not a circuit yet. The, the better answer can be written as a series of RT tensor, right? So here we are substituting each of these by the RT. Okay, uh, so now the first is, uh, and now we will go uh, from top to the bottom, uh, uh, performing QR decompositions. Uh, so we start with this RT on the top right of the better answer. So this thing here, 
Uh, so first thing we notice is that this is uh, this is an ancilla qubit. We can get rid of it. Since this is nothing physical, this is just a, a, a tensor uh, where we only care about certain indices, then we can just uh, take the part of the tensor that we are interested in and make a smaller tensor with that and remove the ancilla. So this is the first thing we do. This is non-unitary, so we call this T0. Um, Right, and um, and since okay here again since here we have zeros we this we just uh, need to uh, retain this index here so this is a two times two to the m uh, uh, matrix um, or tensor uh, I mean depending on how you write it and um, right. Um, Okay, so what we do then is we have uh, substitute this RT by this G0. So now uh, we go to the next RT in the circuit, and then we uh, glue together this G0 with the next RT tensor, right? And this will this is just another uh, another tensor, another matrix. And since we know that for any matrix we can perform a QR decomposition, uh, that's exactly what we do. We say this is a matrix. Then let's do its it's a QR decomposition. Uh, so this will be the product of a Q, which is unitary. Here, P, here the pink uh, the pink uh, boxes will be unitary, and the green ones will be non-unitary. So here, by performing this QR decomposition, then we have a, a unitary matrix and a non-unitary matrix. Um, right, and we will iterate this process. And by the way, here I didn't. Um, draw it but the, in the process here we remove another ancilla i mean if, if you just go and check uh, uh you can see that this uh, this will be the case uh I mean, you go through the papers or the details in each of these steps we will be removing uh, uh sorry one of the ancillas um right um so um, yeah, so we iterate this process uh, and then uh, we paste this G1 to the next RT tensor and repeat this thing to obtain P2 and G2. And we should notice here that the size of the matrices here, I mean, we do this uh, for P1 through PM minus one. And here the size of the matrices grow from uh, four by four matrix, eight times eight matrix until we get that two to the M times two to the N matrix where M is the number of, of exc excitations. Um, okay. And once we get to this point, we keep iterating, but now uh, we can define a recursive equation because now the, the size of the matrices will not change. So we can just put this in a, into a single equation, which is the following one. We have the G from the previous step. We paste it to the next RT tensor. We make the QR decomposition given us a unitary and a, a non-unitary. Okay, and this is this will be from from the moment we have removed all the ancillas on from so from for k uh, larger or equal than m, uh, then this p uh, k will be a, an isometry at two uh, m plus m plus one times two to the m uh, isometry, right? And this is because we have a fixed state input state here; it's zero. And then, okay, we have the freedom to just um, promote this to a unitary to fill the rest of the of, of the matrix as at will. Okay, so how do we solve this equation? Uh, sorry, just last uh, last like this last implication I didn't uh, get. So I understand that you reorganize your operators uh, like by sort of putting those ones and zeros like. Uh, in like one to the uh, bottom, the other to the top, then you do iterative QR decomposition. So you, let's say you, you propagate this upper tri triangular parts throughout like, like kind of lower and lower. And what is left would be then uh, just like unitary or it would be a circuit. I will show that it will be in a second. Uh... I okay, will. but that, like, that's the intuition. But like, I, I, I kind of got lost. Like, what is so? You, okay, and this is how you, uh, like, this is the step how you, it, uh, how you do it iteratively, right? 
exactly. So can you explain again this, uh, those steps? Sorry. Yeah. Um, from here or? Um, so or like just, maybe uh, like the uh, here, yeah. Okay, yeah, here. So yeah, so we, we perform, so this G uh, from a step K minus one, this is the non-unitary part that we are propagating uh, to the yeah. bottom of the circuit, right? Uh, so here we do a QR decomposition. So we have a Q times R, so a unitary matrix and a, an upper triangular matrix. Uh, this is an isometry because we have a fixed input state and we do so until the end. And now I will, I mean, I will first explain if that's okay, the, um, how we solve this recursion and then I will show the termination, how it ends and why uh, why this is actually unitary because it's not obvious that just going and just putting your, your non-unitary part to the end will 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 work. But yeah. I'll show later uh, in a moment uh, how why it works. Um, so here to solve this equation, uh, what we do is we multiply by the um, uh, adjoint on both sides and since P it's an isometry, then uh, we can get rid of it. And then we get an equation which only depends on the edges, uh, which is very convenient uh, to solve, um, especially because these are upper triangular matrices. Uh, so we need to solve here for G. Uh, and once we have the G, then it's, it's easy to obtain a, a PK because we just need to invert and, and get uh, the piece. And, Again, the fact that the G's are upper triangular is important in this inversion because then the inversion is trivial. Whereas if it were a general matrix, it wouldn't be. Um, okay, now uh, coming to your question, uh, why we can discard the, the non-unitary uh, part? Well, the, the, the key realization is that at the end of the circuit, uh, we have a, a bunch of ones here and uh, it turns out that these G's and these P's they individually preserve the U1 symmetry, uh, which means that they, they preserve the number of excitations, right? Therefore, when when here I if if we apply here the uh, QR decomposition, then the G could be acting on this uh, on a all one states, and since it preserves the number of the number of ones, then it can only be a global factor. Right, because it has to map this state to, I mean, it has to preserve the number of ones. And here we have an all, uh, here it will be all ones. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the reason why in the end, uh, this thing uh, works. Um, yeah, so here we have the complete picture uh, and we end up with this circuit, uh, um, this unitary circuit. Uh, where these matrices, uh, you may have noticed these matrices have a size, a size which is exponential in the number of magnets, which in general may be a problem, but also uh, later in some cases it is not. And then in, in others, it, for, it is still not clear whether we can somehow uh, bypass an exponential scaling. Um, right. So some, some remarks, uh, as I already mentioned, the upper triangular structure of, of the G's of the, of the non-unitary part is key uh, to both to invert and to solve the recursion relation. It makes our life way easier. Uh, then there is a subtlety that uh, took us some time to realize, but, uh, but uh, it turns out that there is a, a large gauge freedom in this QR decomposition. Uh, recall that if we have A, with this composition as QR or in our notation PG, uh, then we can uh, multiply P by a unitary diagonal uh, D minus one and G by uh, DG, and then uh, we recover A. And we impose that these diagonal so that the upper triangular structure is, uh, is conserved. And then the fact that it has to be unitary, it means that these are uh, phases. It's a diagonal matrix uh, with phases. And these phases are not unique. And it turns out that when you actually want to compile uh, the unitaries that we find to gates, uh, this gate freedom uh, is key because it can make your life a lot easier or a lot harder, depending on how you choose them. Um, right, so the complexity of the method is linear in N. We have to solve N minus one uh, recursive QR decompositions, but um, we don't know for sure, but uh, 
probably in general, in full generality, probably is exponential in the number of excitations. Um, although this is still we don't know. Um, but do you okay. expect that the complexity of the state will be then exponential? Or like you are you talking about like okay, do you expect that uh, yeah, that if one were to prepare such states from from uh, additional uh, trivial uh, say that then it's it's exponentially hard or is it only about our your methods? I hope uh, it is not. I mean, because it is if it is, then it, this is very bad news for quantum computers. If we cannot prepare eigenstate of the x axis model or or the Fermi Hubbard model in polynomial time. But um, um, but I think uh, okay in full generality I think maybe it's exponential because you are asking to prepare any eigenstate of the model I mean which is which might be perhaps asking uh, can too I, much. Can I ask just uh, like because those are one D systems right? Yeah, the eigen the ground state should be easy, right? And okay, I, I'm not an expert on condensed matter, but like other gapped or gapless. I think they are gap in the thermodynamic limit. So, I mean, this should be an area law. Um, so, like in principle, they are like uh, describable by MPSs as well, right? Like at least approximately, right? Yes, I think so. Yes. Um, I think so. Um, for the XXZ model, uh, I think so. Um, although I, I need to to actually, we are now working on, on how to try to make the, the the circuits, these circuits efficient for uh, interacting models. Um, okay, let's see if we succeed. And um, uh, but I think it is. But there is something I'm not entirely sure, which is the following. Uh, here, if you have the algebraic beta answer, um, you can see that. But, but for the ground state, it must be. Uh, but in general, um, you see that we can understand this as an MPS if we take all this R1 through Rm mm -hmm. and we make it a tensor, then this is an MPS. The thing is the dimension is two times two times. Uh, so it's an exponential dimension in the number of magnums. Yeah. So in general, the ground state has a number of magnums or excitation that is a number of sides, sides divided by two. So it, has, it has scales with the number. Uh, mm -hmm. So the number of ones scales with the number of uh, sides. So in general, for this for this uh, sector, you will need a, an MPS with a bond dimension which is exponential. But perhaps there are, there is some state which is the ground state within this sector which does not, uh, which sure. I mean where you, where you can truncate here and uh, and find a very good approximation. I, okay, like th that was my let's say intuition. This is what I remember that you know if you have a gap in the thermodynamic gap system, you can probably you know like a finite bond dimension you can approximate right yeah I mean, but also it's about approximating the ground state i guess not about getting it exactly right that's also correct yes um okay but yeah. okay this is my life i i'm not expert on this but sure. right no no i also don't I'm not know not. whether mpss can be okay i would probably think that probably they they can be efficiently uh implemented on a quantum yeah i mean as long as the bond dimension is 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 not uh, exponential in system yeah. size uh, then you can do it uh ah. efficiently so that would be a natural let's say uh, angle from which some nasty referee could maybe poke your work or <laughs> well uh, i mean the thing is i okay, mean this for is, the this, state, at least. Yeah. yeah for the ground state that's the thing uh but uh, this method in general will can prepare like any eigenstate uh, of sure. the um, of the of the model. Sure, uh, sure. But uh, yeah, for the for the ground state, probably uh, in this model it is correct. But the method also works for other models, and not I'm not sure if sure, all sure. I'm, I'm just trying to understand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, no. Yeah. Thank, yeah, it's, it's fine. Um, no, no, but I mean you're right. Um, um, Okay, um, so now let, let's look at the method was general method then okay we, we apply to the XXZ model for concreteness and, and to see uh, how it looked like. 
Uh, so first, uh, we look at the XX model, where, which is the XX set model where the, this uh, set set term is, is, is zero. So this is a free fermionic uh, model. And in this case, uh, we find that if we take our matrices P, K, and we use this uh, match case um, in this ladder structure, um, we we show that uh, one layer of this match gate is enough to uh, to to find the exact unitaries, and we we did this analytically for two magnums and three magnums, uh, and then numerically uh, for up to six magnums, I think. So we believe that this uh, will hold uh, in general. Uh, so what this means is that okay. Uh, since okay, we, we saw that the, the size of these P matrices grows exponentially with the number of, of magnons, of the, with the number of excitations, but um, but also these matrices um, preserve uh, the uh, block diagonal structure, which means that uh, if we know that this is uh, how we can decompose this matrix, we only need. We don't need to look at the entire matrix to find this decomposition. Uh, there are not that many parameters that you need to fix here. Um, and therefore, it suffice, suffices to look at the one magnum sector to actually solve for these uh, matrices. So this means that even though the size of the matrices in general grows uh, exponentially because they act in, an, in a number of sites that grows with the number of excitations, here we can bypass that exponential scaling and do it efficiently, which of course may be related to the fact that uh, these are uh, free fermionic uh, uh, models. And actually when we do this, uh, the, the size of the circuits that we find is, um, is uh, the state of the art uh, up to constant factors. I mean, the scaling is, is, is the, um, is the um, yeah, state of the art uh, scaling for um, for free fermionic uh, systems? Uh, if you look at other papers that prepare Slater determinants or or things like that, uh, the scaling is is the same that uh, as here. Um, so this uh, make us think that probably the or maybe uh, it could well be that the better answer is actually a good way to proceed to try to find exact circuits because you were asking before okay maybe you're trying to, to construct the the eigenstate from the beta answer but that doesn't mean this is the only way of doing it this might not be the most efficient one uh, but here is a hint that this might be the case or it can be the case um, um right so again uh yeah we don't know how it happens when we go to the interacting xx set and here we just did some preliminary, uh, let's say, numerics to try to see uh, how it goes. And but okay, this was like a in our minds, this is like a project on its own. So we wanted to just uh, uh, show the method and then okay, try to see when when this is applied to different models how the scaling goes. And okay, here you have for different values of the anisotropy, uh, different. Okay, here we just use this ansat. Um, we could use many other and we could try many more refined things, but we wanted just to have some 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 preliminary uh, study, let's say, or, or some first approach to it. And OK, you can see that you can get uh, good compilation errors, but the problem is how the number of layers scales with the number of, of magnums. Um, so with this naive approach, it looks like it is exponential, but again, there might be some shortcut. Uh, that we are not uh, seeing at the moment. Right, uh, then, okay, well, then we did some numerical simulations uh, on the left to uh, verify that the method is correct and actually works. Um, so we simulated our quantum circuit and also the tensor network and we compared the results and, and they agree perfectly. Um, and uh, yeah, here I'm just uh, showing the results of the circuit for some two body and four body correlators uh, for different number of magnons and 24 uh, qubits. Um, and then on the right, we I'm showing um, 
the results of an implementation on the IBM uh, quantum machines. Uh, so this is uh, the ground state of the XXZ model for four sites and two, um, and therefore uh, two MAC nodes, two excitations. And uh, yeah, and we also applied uh, error mitigation techniques um, to improve the result. Um, yeah, and that's it. And and now um, the Jambaster um, equation. Sorry, can I can I ask about this, those experimental results? So, um, so like the, uh, like what was the depth of the of circles that you had, and uh, were you doing mitigation? Like what form of mitigation you were using? Like zero noise extrapolation or uh, readout yeah, mitigation? So no, actually, I learned about the readout mitigation that you proposed uh, when you gave uh, the talk here. Uh, and um, so here, um, here we are uh, doing, uh, yeah, zero noise extrapolation and also Clifford data regression, regression uh, with variable noise. I mean, we did both with variable noise or, or not. And um, and the depth of the circuit. <sighs> I don't remember, but I don't remember off the top of my head. Actually, I actually didn't do this uh, experimental implementations. Uh, I, I can check it and, and tell you uh, if you're interested. Uh, but the, the results are pretty good, uh, uh, I would say, especially when, when you meet the error mitigate them. Sure. Um, but but in any case, of course, these are not very big circuits. You can imagine. I mean, this is four sides, uh, right? But like a few like different states, right? Like not only the ground state, but excited. Right? No, these are yeah, exactly. These are uh, exactly these are uh, three different states, and uh, one is the ground state, and then we also have excited states. Um, right. Yeah. Okay. So now. Uh, Another result that we derive along the way uh, is this um, reformulation of the Jan Buster equation in terms of unitary matrices. So what is the Jan Buster equation? The Jan Buster equation is the one that uh, you have uh, on the bottom. So it's basically telling you if you have, an, and this equation, uh, what guarantees is that the state that you obtain at the end is independent of the order in which you apply uh, the the lambdas. So here, if I make a permutation of the indices in the R matrices, so I apply here, let's say lambda two first and lambda one afterwards, uh, then the resulting state will be independent of the order. And this is what guarantees integrability and which of course simplifies the problem and make it, makes it uh, solvable. So uh, can I ask Diego, so, in, yeah. in what you were describing, like in this procedure, you are actually not using this structure or you are using it? No, we are not using it. And we were concerned that uh, using it should be, uh, should simplify our lives. And then that's how we actually we came up with this uh, unitary form. Mm -hmm. um, but we didn't find any way of actually using it beyond the one that actually this structure works, I mean, and it's guaranteed by the Jan Buster equation. Uh, so, I mean, you are already using it in a sense. Uh, but uh, yeah, that was actually the motivation to, to try to see what the, the Jan Buster equation would imply for our circuits. And then that's how we ended up with this uh, new form of the Jan Buster equation. But we couldn't directly apply it to it to simplify uh, the problem. We didn't gain anything mm -hmm. from, from doing so. I mean, but, I okay, but you have yeah. to like simultaneously permute basically rows of this uh, sort of tensor network, right? Is it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, you, you permute the, the, this entire uh, row, yeah. Or any entire, yeah, you make a permutation of the rows. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sure. Thanks. Uh, and uh, yeah, so the Jan Buster equation is, is this one here. Basically, it's telling you if I, if I have two R matrices, like R lambda with, with two different rapidities, so R uh, of lambda and R of mu, then what happens if I permute them, uh, mu to lambda? And then it turns out that the relation between these two uh, is this particular one with R, with 
an extra R matrix uh, where the input parameter is the difference between the rapidities. And actually, uh, what we saw is that uh, this is a particular case of, of a more general relation that holds, which is which refers to this block of R matrices, uh, these RT tensors. So basically, uh, what we saw is that uh, if you make a permutation of the um, of the rapidities of the better roots in this tensor, then there is a relation between the two uh, given by uh, some other uh, tensor R sigma. And this is, as I said, this is a particular case of this. Um, and uh, with this, what we arrived at, I, I won't show the derivation here, but it's it's simple. So if you are interested, you can you can check the paper. What we show is that um, we can get a unitary version of 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 the uh, Jan Buster equation, in the sense that let's say we have a unitary in our circuit. What happens if we permute the rapidities? Um, and it turns out there is a relation between the two, and it's given by these two matrices. So this resembles the form of the Jan Buster equation. And it turns out this, this matrices um, are unitary. So this is the unitary version or, or a unitary version, let's say, of the Jan Buster equation. Um, right. Uh, so as an example here, let's say I have two rapidities. Uh, and then I have my unitary matrix, which depends on these rapidities. And then let's say I permute the two. Uh, then, yeah, how how is my unitary transform? And it is done, and the, the, yeah, this relation is is achieved by these two unitary matrices. And since these are all unitaries, it turns out we can check this this thing on actual quantum hardware. <laughs> and we did so, and uh, it was tested with a 96% fidelity in the output uh, on IBM quantum computers. Of course, I for guess small... it was test, it's mathematically proven, right? Pardon? Mm -hmm. So those things, they are just like mathematical theorems, right? Or sort of, uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, no, this, this is an equality that, uh, yeah, it was uh, proven. Uh, by ourselves, and uh, yeah, of course, this comes uh, from noise. The fact that it's not uh, exact, um, but but as I said, the derivation is is simple. So so you want you can you can check it quickly. Um, yeah. So with this, I will I will conclude. Um, yeah. So as 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 I show to you, uh, it may be interesting to prefer better answer eigenstates on a quantum computer. Uh, and we show that this algebraic beta answer can be converted into a unitary uh, quantum circuit uh, for its direct implementation on a quantum computer. We have also, well, we haven't proven in full generality, but we have good um, evidence that this conversion is sufficient for free fermion models. I mean, we have proven it in, in particular cases. And um, yeah, it is still unclear what's the scaling uh, in full generality for interactive models and whether we can bypass uh, um, the situation, the exponential scaling for large number of magnets. But in any case, the, like if you have for sure low number of magnets, there are also non-trivial states there and the scaling with the number of sites is very good. Uh, so you can prepare easily because it's linear with n. Uh, so you can prepare low number uh, states with a low number of magnets uh, efficiently. And um, yeah, I didn't remember this slide. Uh, yeah, uh, it's, uh, yeah, OK. Uh, this, as I was saying, can we obtain something efficient? Uh, because here, the, the, here it's important that both the quantum circuit is efficient and also the, the iterative QR decomposition must be efficient, uh, the classical procedure. Uh, so if you are restricting yourself to a small sector, then both things are efficient. Uh, and yeah, here I, I just posed the question whether this is related to the dimension of the, of the subspaces, the Lie algebra, et cetera. And yeah, we definitely need to explore more the, the compilation of the unitaries and extend 
a future possible direction could be to extend this method to other to other models and see what happens. And yeah, that was it. Uh, here's the archive uh, reference. And uh, yeah, thank you for your for your attention. Thank you, Diego, for for a nice uh, talk. Uh, yes, we have time for questions and comments to the speaker. So I encourage everybody to engage in the discussion. I I ask too many questions already. No, not too many. I mean, it's it's good to ask questions. <laughs> Right, okay, just maybe, a, okay, I, let me ask something like this, this comment you had in the very end that uh, this, uh, that you can prepare those states efficiently when the number of magnets is small. Um, so, I, I mean, uh, just if you're in such a sect, like few particle sector, then, you know, all your, uh, as far as I understand, all your construction, basically how to put it i mean first of all it's it's exponential in, so it's it will be efficient if m is let's say logarithmic right or, or like if m is constant or sub logarithmic it will be efficient right uh but also like okay uh, if you are just stuck in this subspace with few particles like the dimension of the space is kind of small uh, so the complexity cannot be sort of larger than like d squared or something when d is the dimension of that subspace. So it's yeah. probably okay. Uh, yeah, that's correct. So that that's why this. I mean, the most interesting part is is actually the open question because these states are not. Uh, I mean, you can still use them as input uh, to other quantum states and then do something like some quantum simulation, which is classically non-simulable. So I mean, there can be a still value to them. And that's why also like people have studied like free fermionic models, how to implement them on quantum computers. But but yeah, I mean, if the number of magnums is small, um, just by the MPS construction uh, of the tensor network, then the bond dimension is small as well. So um, you can do this uh, classically too. So the big question is, can you do this like for like, uh, yeah, for, uh, for this so, large? Uh, so, for, for, for like non-trivial, let's say, part. Mm -hmm. So can you, okay, I, I didn't quite catch this unitary Young-Baxter equation. Uh, uh, can you? So, uh, so I understand that those matrices are, they are those matrices that you sort of uh, had previously, right? Like sort of two, uh, yeah. two by, uh, Sorry, four by four. Exactly. Right, uh, right. right. So, the, so this is some funny identity. Okay, it's not like a group thing, but they, you can kind of permute those things. Like you have such identities in your circuit. Okay, and then what, what I didn't like above, like what is this, this R, I'm a bit confused with this R sigma. What, what yeah. is that? So these are, they are the, um, yeah, these big blocks. Um, so one column, let's say here, of our matrices, yeah. or here one one block of it, um, and then so that's um, R T, and then then you have the same thing, but with with the R's uh, permuted. And R sigma is what the the so, uh, about T. And this is a, a this one. This is a matrix, uh, like uh, like like in this case is an uh, this these are. Uh, lambda minus mu is playing the role of this R. This is the, the matrix that, um, yeah, that gives you the relation, be how the transformation between the two. And you can obtain this thing iteratively from this one, like uh, grouping uh, together. Like if you put an RT tensor, then you apply Jan Buster uh, in its permutation, uh, permutation, and then you end up with, uh, with this thing. Okay, and this symbol, like, uh like a tilted line with M. So it corresponds to like having zeros or like ones in that output or? No, here it, it just means that we have M lines. Um, M lines, yeah. I see, I see. 
Ah, and this is a mm -hmm. right. And can you move to the just the next like the next line? Sorry, like the next slide. So, so here, okay, it's something okay similar, but uh, okay, what are okay, what are those objects? So, so because in the previous site everything was sort of built. I understand from those uh, fundamental R news R lambdas, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, and now, uh, when you have those P's and M's, yeah, like what are those? Yeah, so the P's are the um, the unitary matrices that we uh, obtain for the quantum circuit, um, right? So we obtain first P1, P2, so the I like see, first yes. matrix. That, that, so these are the unitary matrices that appear yeah. in our circuit. And then these are other matrices which turn out to be a uh, unitary. Um, mm -hmm. And actually at the beginning, I was not expecting this matrices necessarily to be unitary, but uh, it yes. turns out they are. And uh, yeah, they are given by this formula where you have uh, these G matrices, which are the upper triangulars. And then, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, these are sigma, which come from uh, permuting the, the Rs. So, um, so you sort of hope that perhaps using those rules would because it's very particular thing right it's uh yeah i mean this I is integrability you... it's like a very yeah i mean okay okay it's not any kind of group but still perhaps yeah mm. uh, can i have a question please uh, yeah it's basic one because like i'm not really uh, <laughs> that experienced in it but uh, all of that that you proved here is uh, uh, is true only if you have this specific input, or do you pick this specific input because it's like convenient for you? Here so you mean I mean zeros and ones, yeah. Uh, yeah, no. Here we don't have ones, but this zero, um, this will. This is how this the this unitaries, which actually they are isometries, but. You promote them to uh, to to unitary. This is how they appear in the circuit. So this is they always have a given. If you look at the uh, circuit, the resultant circuit, um, and we are in this part. This this these are special ones because you are removing the ancillas. But uh, this is for, yes yes uh, yes yes. But that that, that was my question. Have... That, uh, if, if is this process that you like transition between one and another. Uh, is it only for this given set of inputs or? Yeah, yeah. Okay. This is how they appear in the circuit. Okay, okay, okay. Yes. They always appear with a, with a fixed uh, zero. Okay, thanks. Okay, are there any other questions to Diego? Uh, I have a question ah. re regarding this uh, implementation on an IBM device. Maybe I missed that point, but, but you said that you investigated like a for fairly small system, is that right? That's correct. So, for so, so are there are there some obstacles from like running the simulation for larger systems? Uh, sorry, I'm, I, I you mean the simulations or the, the order? Yeah, I mean or, those experiments. Uh, can can you run it for like a larger system? I mean you can run them, but the problem is that when you run them on quantum hardware, the hardware is noisy. So uh, going beyond, yeah, we did four qubits and we did this on a five qubit chip. So uh, and we wanted also to to have the ground state. So yeah, with these uh, sizes, we could get decent results. Yeah, certainly you can increase the size of the um, of the experiment, but then yeah, the quantum computers are noisy. So um, I see. So, no, but the simulations are, are for 24 uh, qubits. Um, yeah, this I understand that. Do you have some analytical insights about how the noise affects those results, like experimental one? Um, to try to model somehow, like uh, uh, for this state, and, and I, um, yeah, have them on a quantum computer, but uh, now we didn't delve into okay, that. Okay, thanks. Okay, I got uh, cut off for a moment. Uh, uh, yeah, but uh, okay, and it, okay, last chance to ask something to Diego. Okay, if there are no further questions, let's thank the speaker again uh, for the great talk and discussion.